I'm Miranda Cosgrove. Hi. I'm Miranda Cosgrove. Hi. I'm Miranda Cosgrove. Hi. I'm Miranda Cosgrove. Hi. I'm Miranda Cosgrove. And this is Mission Unstoppable. It's science. You know? You could fit 1.3 million Earths inside the sun. Well, not you. You're not strong enough to lift even one Earth. Get real.
welcome back to Science and Stuff here on Mission Unstoppable's Twitch and YouTube channel. We <laughs> we do this show um, every single week, every Monday, and it's all about women who work in STEM. And so in case you've never been here before, I'm Lexi, um, and this show, um, Science and Stuff, is based off of Mission Unstoppable which is a show that airs every Saturday morning on CBS, hosted by none other than Miranda Cosgrove, as you can see in the picture. Um, she is the coolest person in the world, to say the least, and um, it's, it's, uh, she's the best host, and we have the best show with the best guests. Um, you'll actually get to experience some of that today because we have one of the guests from the show on here. She'll be on um, a little bit later, but um the show the show that airs every saturday is all it's different women working in their different career their different stem careers so each saturday there's um about four or five different women in each episode that are in all different kinds of fields you know we have them from chemical engineers to conservation conservationalists to all different chem chemists there's everything. There are so many different STEM career fields that I actually didn't even know existed until I saw them on the show. So make sure you check out the show because you will absolutely learn cool things and it might even help you learn about a career path you want to go down. Um, also, make sure that you are following us across all social media at CBS Unstoppable. Uh, you'll, you will basically get to see a lot of really, really fun content of different women working in STEM. Um, so there's all different, so we have our Instagram, we have our YouTube, of course, which I know we are live on right now. So make sure you subscribe to us there because we have so much fun stuff there. We even have, in case you've missed it, we have an entire series called Miranda Cosgrove STEM Loft, where she teaches us really cool facts every single week. And we have nine episodes up so far of 10 total. So this week is going to be our last brand new episode of this season. And so make sure that you check it out and subscribe so that you don't miss it when it comes out at 3 p.m. But in case you've never seen what that entire series is, here's a trailer that you can check out. I'm Miranda Cosgrove. Welcome to the STEM Loft. Join me each week as I tell you some of my favorite STEM facts. Ever heard of the immortal jellyfish? Or what about tree farts? Yep. You heard it right. I even share some amazing discoveries from my friend, Dr. Jessica Esquivel, and her work involving quantum realms. Go Sharks! It's gonna be so much fun. New episodes every Friday. The mushrooms are listening. Bye! Um, that is one of my favorite series, and they every single episode is kind of mind-blowing because you get to learn some really, really cool facts, like koala fingerprints are very similar to humans which could mess with police police um, crime scenes and things like that so it's a really really fun little show and you can impress all of your friends by sharing the facts with them very fun so make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel so you don't miss the last episode when it comes out this friday but also make sure that you follow us everywhere so that you don't miss out make sure you also Follow us on Twitch because our chat is followers only. So we would love for you to participate in the chat and be part of it. Ask our guests any questions that you, may ha that you might have. So make sure you follow us and make sure you subscribe. We have more shows um, each week. We do all different kinds of shows from roundtable discussions of different STEM facts to um, hands-on activities to shows about gaming. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on any of it. Um, of course, it is now time for our favorite. It's time for Science Newsy News. Yay! Yay! So, for our first story of today, it's about something that is very pretty, but also might lead to some really, really cool discoveries. So, NASA is actually set to launch two rockets into the Northern Lights. It, like to, oh, look at how pretty it is. So this will actually allow researchers to study and measure the winds, the densities and temperatures in the, in the Northern Lights. So they'll be able to learn more about it and figure out exactly what 
um, can, they understand what causes it, but this allows them to be able to understand the science so much deeper into it. So the rockets will be launched right into the heart of the Northern Lights in order to get some strong measurements. Um, the launch window for NASA, for NASA's mission actually opened on Wednesday, March 23rd, and it runs through April 1st, and then another window opens April 3rd through the 7th. So the launch that was supposed to happen Wednesday the 23rd ended up having to get moved because of bad weather. So we are just staying staying aware of what is happening so that we can see the results. I'm really excited about it. So you might actually know this in case you happen to see this Mission Unstoppable segment from, from last season. It was in season two. It was one of the last ones. Um, so we do of course have some knowledge about the northern lights and what causes these lights so the lights actually form when charged particles from space crash into the molecules in earth's upper atmosphere so these collisions boost the energy of the electrons into a higher energy state and when the buzz wears off the electrons then drop back down to their original energy state which then releases a photon or a particle of light and they're able to do so so these these photons end up creating the shifting curtains of green and violet and red and purple that we see in the northern lights and obviously you can see how pretty it is in that that picture um but yeah definitely check out the old mission unstoppable segment on our youtube channel about it because it's really interesting um but this launch this now this launch from NASA will actually just allow us to know even more than we already knew before and get measurements that we've never seen taken. So the team is actually interested in the boundary between neutral gases in the atmosphere and plasma in the charged gas that becomes increasingly prevalent in the upper atmosphere. Uh, the mo molecular disturbance of the aurora actually ends up protruding the boundary layer between the lower atmosphere neutral gases and the higher atmosphere plaza. So this leads to friction, and then the, that is what the researchers are then looking at in order to measure what that heat is giving off. Um, the first of the team's rockets will release colorful vapors as it travels to a height of 186 miles into the air. Um, the vapors are very similar to the chemicals that make fireworks colorful. Uh, well, and so those will actually drift into the atmosphere and allow researchers to trace the atmospheric wind happening at the Northern Lights. Then after that rocket, the next rocket is actually de designed to reach a peak height of 125 miles in order to carry instruments to measure the temperature and density within the Northern Lights. The rockets will then fall right back to Earth immediately after making their measurements. And so in the end, this should reveal the details of how the Northern Lights alter the boundary layer between the neutral gas and plasma, and the boundary might drop, it might get higher, it might fold, it might change shape. So we'll find out soon, and I'm very excited about it because we'll just get to know more about the Northern Lights. For our second story, Second story of today. This is very exciting development for um, some brain, some brain disabilities or things that happen that can actually end up causing people to have what's known as locked-in syndrome. Um, they researchers have actually been able to develop uh, a way to communicate with patients with locked-in syndrome. Um, in case you don't know what that is, locked-in syndrome is basically where you're still aware of what's happening, but voluntary muscle movements aren't possible. And sometimes there are some, like such as blinking or moving an eye, but sometimes that's not even possible for um, people with locked-in syndrome. One of the common um, popular stories about it that people know about is um, from The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, which is a memoir and also an amazing movie about Dominique Bobby, who um, had locked-in syndrome and was able to write a memoir using his eye to blink in order to um, make, to tell someone what he's trying to say, and then they were able to write it. But that's not always the option, so in that case, then scientists wanted to find another way to be able to allow people with locked-in syndrome to communicate what they need. So for the first time, they've actually been able to communicate with patients through br a brainwave reader. Um, they 
what they did is they implanted two micro electrode arrays into the motor cortex of a 34 year old patient who had no he had no way to express his needs um and he wasn't able to do the things like eye tracking uh, visual categorization, eye movements, anything like that. So they wanted to find some sort of way to see what his brain activity was in order to use that as a way to communicate with him. So while the brainwave reader was in his mind, was reading his, it was not able to read his mind, but while it was doing, while it was trying to figure out what he was saying, the patient could actually answer yes or no questions, questions that he was being asked and he was able to use the reader in order to spell out the words that he's trying to say. So the alphabet would get read out and the patient could then produce a detectable brainwave spike when the letter that they wanted to read was read. Um, as of right now, this is still an early research, but the authors say that the safety, the durability, and the applicability of the implants need to be research further before they can make them available to anyone with locked in syndrome but they do absolutely have hopes for developing faster and more reliable methods of communication for people with locked in syndrome so as a whole this is a very exciting advancement for people with locked in syndrome and being able to help them communicate and still be not lose that that option to communicate while they're still aware of everything happening around them and then for our last and final science newsy news story of today, there's actually, a lot of these have something to do with the Mission Unsolvable segment we've done before, but it is official that now over 5,000 exoplanets have officially been confirmed. So in the past, this is a huge development because in the past few decades, we went from knowing about the existence of just a handful of planets to the realization that planets are actually extremely, extremely common in our galaxy. Uh, since then, thanks to advancements in both ground and space telescopes, the number continues to grow, and NASA has now officially confirmed that we have passed the 5,000 mark of confirmed exoplanets with 5,005 strange new worlds orbiting the Milky Way. So, we, the, I recommend that you check out Moya McTeer's segment on, from Mission Unstoppable this season about exoplanets because you'll get to learn a lot more about the cool little exoplanets. But as of right now, there are actually 8,500 candidates of potential exoplanets that haven't been confirmed yet. Um, and that's just a small number of the amount of planets that are expected to exist in our entire galaxy. Uh, there are hundreds of billions of worlds and planets that scientists believe that we have yet to discover and some that we have never seen in any sort of way and definitely haven't seen up close yet so that's really exciting um and with so many of the worlds out there and finding out about so many other planets we obviously have to wonder is there other life out there um and will finding will confirming these exoplanets help us find evidence for some of that some of these worlds might be inhabited by other life. Um, so that's definitely something that scientists are trying to figure out. Um, and just looking at it, um, scientists do think that evidence is building that the foundational chemistry of life on Earth has close connections to some molecules and chemistry seen elsewhere in the universe. So that's very interesting and definitely could be huge in learning more about other life. Um, also, of the 5,005 worlds discovered, 30% of them are gas giants, kind of like Jupiter and Saturn. 35% are Neptune size, and well, and at the same time, 31% are super Earths, which are a few times bigger than our planet, but not quite as big as Neptune. Um, and then there's 4% 4 of them that are terrestrial, small, rocky planets about the size of Earth or potentially smaller. There's still a lot more to learn about these. Um, there's still a lot more to find out how many there actually are out in our universe. Um, and there's more that scientists wanna know, such as how are these formed, how they evolved, and what are they like at this moment? What were they like in the past and what will they evolve into in the future? So this milestone is just a nice reminder to go out and discover even more and keep track of all the cool stuff happening in space that we just get to keep learning about. That is it for today's science newsy news that'll impress your friends. Science
Yay! Yeah. I I say this every week now, but I'm so excited about um, that Science Newsy News sound coming back. We lost it for a little bit, but it's back, and it's my favorite sound in the world. Um, but I'm so excited for today's stream. Like I was saying earlier at the beginning of the stream, our Monday streams, our Science and Stuff streams, have a guest from the Saturday's episode that aired the week before from Mission Unstoppable. And today we have a really, really special guest. We have Paula Garcia Todd, who is here today to talk to us. She is a chemical engineer. She's a strategic marketing manager. She works in pharmaceuticals. She's an if-then ambassador. She's a STEM advocate. Like I said, she was recently on Mission Unstoppable. She's just the coolest. So she's here. She's going to talk to us a bit about what she does, her journey. Um, and in case you missed her segment, make sure you check it out right here. Science is all about asking questions. For example, is it time for the next guest? The answer is yes. This is an easy one. Most of the science questions are a lot harder. We all know what a vitamin is, right? I mean, I can definitely name some, but have you ever thought about what goes into them? Turns out it's a whole lot of chemistry, dreamt up by a chemical engineer like Paula Garcia Todd. I come from a family of engineers. My grandfather, my dad, my brothers, my uncles, they were all engineers. So from a very young age, I already understood what engineering was and all of these wonderful problems that my family was trying to fix. So I knew that this was a path that I wanted to follow as well. Today, Paula's going to show us the science and the machines behind making vitamin supplements. Here I have three different types of vitamins. They could all contain the same vitamin molecule, but they look really different. We have a hard tablet, a soft gel capsule, and even a gummy. Each one is made in a very different process, but they all contain one thing in common. They all use excipients. Excipients are inactive ingredients within supplements. Think of them like the packing peanuts of a vitamin's package. They're designed to help deliver a vitamin in good working order, and there's a lot of different ways they work. Excipients can be used as binders to hold ingredients together. They can be used to control the release of a vitamin inside your body. They can help stabilize materials that are inside the vitamin. Excipients have so many different functions. They do so many different things inside a vitamin. To see excipients in action, we head into the lab. We're gonna make some gummies with my colleagues, Katie and Drew. So why are excipients even important in gummies? Well, the excipient acts as the gelling agent, which helps to give the gummy that chewy texture. Drew adds one excipient, in this case a gelling agent, to hot water and stirs until it's combined to a jelly solution. Then, even more excipients are added. Each excipient has its own role to play. Some are used to give it the color, some are used for flavor, and together they all combine to give the gummy. The mixture is blended together thoroughly, then poured into molds. Once we filled the molds, we allow them to sit at room temperature until they've cooled and set. But some vitamins, like vitamin E, are liquid at room temperature. They require a soft shell capsule, known as soft gel. Soft gels use excipients as gelling agents, which form the shell of the capsule. In our mixing tank here, we have excipients and water that are stirred and heated. Once again, the mixture is a thick, gooey gel that gets run through this machine, which presses it into thin film. The films are fed in here. So here's where two films come together and get filled with a liquid vitamin at the same time as they're being sealed, and out comes a soft gel. Other vitamins, like vitamin C, are solid and can't be made into gels. Instead, they're turned into tablets. This is a tablet press. This is how tablets are made. This is a hopper where you feed all of your solids into. You can actually see some of the solid powders sitting here. The chute feeds the powder into holes that are spinning on this rotating plate. So as this plate is spinning, there are these presses that come down and actually push down to form the tablet. And as they come back around, they pull apart and they eject or pop out your tablet. As you can see, there's more into making vitamins than you might think. Gummies, gel caps, and tablets are all different types of vitamins, but they all have one thing in common, excipients. 
Hey, it's Miranda Cosgrove, your favorite host of of that segment so much, so much fun. Um, and it makes me look at my vitamins so much differently. Every time I take them, I understand what goes into them. So that's very fun. Um, let's welcome Paula. Hello. How are you? I'm great. I'm so excited to be here, Lexi. Thanks for having me. Yay. I'm so excited that you're here. This is so exciting. Like I just said, I love your segment so much. It's so much fun. And it's just so cool to see that side of what goes into making vitamins. It's something that I haven't really thought much about prior to seeing your segment. So really, really awesome. Yeah, most people don't even think about it. I mean, they just take a vitamin and they have no idea that these, these things have to be made somehow, somewhere, right? So exactly. it's fun to show that side. Totally. That's awesome. So as your background is that you're a chemical engineer, right? Correct. Awesome. So what exactly does a chemical engineer do? What doesn't a chemical engineer do? Ooh. So <laughs> so the number one question we're always asked is, what's the difference between a chemist and a chemical engineer? And that's a fair question because most people don't know the difference. So I always talk about the main difference being scale or how much material is being made. So when you mm. think of a chemist, let's pretend a chemist comes up with a new medicine for cancer treatment. When mm -hmm. they do it, they're doing it in a lab, like what we call bench scale. So when they're running the chemistry and they're doing all of their different filtrations and all the different steps, at the end, they could come out with a really small amount, like maybe five, 10 grams of material, where it's the job oh. of a chemical engineer to take that process and create a huge manufacturing plant so we come out with kilograms or metric tons of material in the end so we can get that new medicine to the patients that need it. So it's about scale. A chemist does everything in the lab and a chemical engineer takes that same reaction, that same process and scales it up so we make lots and lots and lots of that molecule. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. It's obviously that's a very, difference. very important job for people to have because that's how we get our medicine and things like that. Absolutely. And if you think about it, chemistry is in everything. It's in the clothes that you wear. It's in the food that you eat. It's in the gas that goes in your car. Um, it's in plastics. It, it, it's everywhere. And so really chemists are essential in all those industries. And then chemical engineers really help bring all those products to life, right? And to be able to get all of those products to all the people that want them and need them. That's great. And so I know in your segment, you mentioned that growing up, you were surrounded by engineers. Were there other engineering paths or anything that you were inspired to maybe go down before you landed on chemical engineering? Yeah. So my father is a mechanical engineer. My brothers are electrical and chemical engineers. Mm. My grandfather was a mining engineer. So I saw a lot of different examples. Um, and to be honest, when I was younger, I thought I wanted to be a doctor. But oh. I realized that I faint at the sight of blood. So I would be a terrible doctor. So I had to <laughs> nix that very quickly. Um, but I still really had that deep desire to help people. And I wanted to help people that were sick in some way, shape, or form. And it was actually my brother, who's a chemical engineer, that introduced me to some of the things that he was learning about. Mm. And I realized that with a chemical engineering degree, I could go into pharmaceuticals. And so I chose chemical engineering knowing that I always wanted to follow this path to make either pharmaceuticals or vitamins or things that make people feel better. So, so that was how I came into chemical engineering. I love that. So you're able to kind of combine what you what you knew and were surrounded by, and also this ability to take a problem and fix it as engineers do, but then also yep. use that for a passion that you had of maybe becoming a doctor or something in the medical field without having to necessarily be the one directly working with the patient, you are sending what is then. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's really awesome. Yes. And it is. And 
in a, in, you know, there are a lot of careers in STEM that are kind of like that behind the scenes, you know, like you think of a doctor, you think of a teacher, you think of, you know, there are these very forward facing careers, but behind them, like that's the perfect example, right? Like we can make the medicines and we can even like, you think about bio, um, bioengineers or biomedical engineers that are creating the equipment that's used in a hospital to allow you to see, you know, x-rays and ultrasounds and things like that, right? So there are a lot of STEM related careers that really allow those forward facing careers that we learn as we're growing up to really function and do their jobs really well. Yeah. And I also, I like that it kind of shows that you you had this overall interest of the medical field, but then you found something different within it instead of it being like, oh, okay, now if I can't do this one specific thing in the medical field, then the medical field's not for me. You found something else in it in order to still be in it in some way, just that better suits you and what you're able to handle in seeing like patients it, this way you don't have Absolutely. to see the patients but you're still doing what you want in the field you want Absolutely. i love that 100 percent. and that's a great yeah. that's a great like message to anyone who wants to pursue a career in something but might not feel like they belong in the more traditional paths or the paths that we see more often in the media yeah, because I mean, there, at the end of the day, there are a lot of different jobs. There are a lot, there's a lot of collaboration that happens that you don't think about, right? And so yeah. maybe, maybe that one specific job isn't right for you, but there, I'm sure there are other jobs and fields that still allow you to participate in that space. Absolutely. Definitely. I think that's great. And I, I love that, like, you are a prime example of love having a passion and then finding a way in a different field to make it happen. But so you chose chemical engineering. What was that process like? And like, what kind of school did you have to do? And how did you follow that career path? So luckily, I always really loved math. And there was a lot of math that goes into chemical engineering. For sure, there's chemistry. And I enjoyed chemistry too. But there's a lot more math than chemistry that happens with chemical engineering. Um, and so to prepare myself for that, when I was in high school, I, taught, I, I took as much math as I could, as well as I really challenged myself in the chemistry classes that I chose and things like that. And I feel like that really prepared me when I went to college because then it wasn't the very first time I was seeing things. Hmm. It was more comfortable, right? And then it allows you to grow from that space too. Because if the very first time you're seeing something is when you're sitting in a college classroom, that can be very intimidating, That's right? Scary. And so very scary. So if you have an interest, I, I, I could, you know, I would tell you to go ahead and challenge yourself now. Try those things. Try those classes as early as you can, and it will only help you propel whenever you get into college or wherever you go next to keep learning. Yeah, I love that. And so it's a nice little introduction into what you're doing, and that will help you know if that's what you want to study further and prevent that shock while you're sitting in a classroom feeling like, everyone knows what's going on, but you don't, that's never a good feeling. Yes. Not even a good feeling. Not they even... might not know what they're doing either. It's just they, everyone that's true too. Good. That's very true. That's very true. Um, You're usually not alone. Exactly. Exactly. But so how much school did you have to go to, to become a chemical engineer? So I went to four years of college to get my undergraduate degree. And then I added on one more year to get a master's. So I have okay. both a bachelor's and a master's in chemical nice. engineering. And the other key that allowed me to do that so quickly for my master's, because usually a master's program is two years. Right. When, I was, when I was early on, it was my sophomore year in college, I decided to try research. And I know it sounds like oh. really intimidating, but I had an interest. I wanted to know, like, what is research? How is it done? Like, how does this work? And so I found a professor that was doing some really cool research. He was genetically changing plants to produce medicines. And so I approached him and I asked him, hey, like, I have an interest. Would you take me in as an undergraduate student? He said, absolutely. And so... 
by the time I hit my senior year, I had almost three years of research under my belt that I turned into my master's thesis. What? So sometimes all it takes is a little initiative and a little curiosity to get you really moving into the next step, which happened that's, for me. That's really cool. And so I'm sure that also by doing that hands-on research and actually getting to dive into it, you were able to just expand everything so much further and feel more comfortable going into that master's program. Yes, absolutely. Because when you're sitting in a classroom and you're learning a lot of the equations and the theories and everything else, that's not necessarily what you do in that job. It takes like those hands-on experiences, working in a lab or doing an internship yeah. or getting a summer job that really gets you to understand what does this job really look like and feel like. You won't necessarily get that in a classroom. Definitely, that's, that's awesome. So in order to get that opportunity to do the research, you just found a professor that you liked and that you thought what they were doing was interesting and just kind of made it happen? Absolutely. Why not? I mean, yeah. if you don't ask, you'll never know, right? So, exactly. yeah. I didn't even know him. I just made an appointment with him and asked. So, nice. Worked for me. That's <laughs> awesome. So, for everyone listening, if you happen to see some sort of field that you're interested in, definitely find that kind of like research opportunity so that you can really get to dive into it deeper and get that hands-on experience because I'm sure like Paula was just sharing that you can learn so much more from actually engulfing yourself in it. So I love that. Um, what were some of your favorite parts about studying chemical engineering? So uh, chemical engineering, so because chemistry is everywhere, I love that chemical engineers are, in this, are needed in almost every industry. So I love the fact that chemical engineers are really like impacting your life every day, whether you know it That's or not. True. The phone, the phone that you use, there's a chemical engineer behind it. The granola bars that you like to eat, there's a chemical engineer behind That's that. Wild. Literally, like everything is touched by a chemical engineer. That was probably one of my favorite things about learning about chemical engineering. Yeah. Yeah, just how much that they're, they, it literally every single thing that we come in contact with. We yep. had, um, not too long ago, we had um, Aisha Lowry on our stream and she was yes. sharing so much just about how you cannot go like a second without looking at something that chemical engineers made happen or everything you're touching, every, like everything, it, there's a chemical engineer behind it. That's so cool. Yes. Yes. When was the last time you hugged a chemical engineer and thanked them? Think about that. <laughs> I'm slacking. I am definitely slacking. I'll fix that. <laughs> that is so, I, I love that. I think that's so cool. And so obviously that's a type of job that people will need around forever. It's probably just constantly growing and growing. If there's someone listening who might be in high school and maybe wants to get into chemical engineering, what kind of classes or extracurricular activities would you recommend that they maybe get involved in? So I hope that your school has some type of engineering club. Actually, just today, I visited a local high school. They have an engineering club for girls. And we did oh, some experiments fun. together, which was really fun. Yeah, so look for, I like to tell people to kind of look for their people and like build a community, right? And so if you can find programs like that, awesome. If you can't, the other idea I would encourage you to consider is maybe like a shadowing. So try Ooh. to find someone in your community who is a chemical engineer. Maybe your friends know some people or teachers and see if you can follow them around for a day and see what it's like to work in their environment, to work in their lab, or maybe they work in one of these big manufacturing plants and you can walk around and get a sense of what that feels like. So just a day of shadowing can, I think, open your eyes and expose you to a lot of what that job would look like. Definitely. And just being, yeah, being able to see it firsthand and see what a day in the life is like. I think that that's a great place to start as well. Um, 
You did just mention that you had that you were at a school today doing an experiment. Yes. Are we able to see a little bit of what that experiment was? Yes, I can yes. definitely show you the experiment. Yay. And what I love about this experiment is that it ties back to the segment that you just watched. So Yay. if you recall in the segment, we made soft gel capsules. The soft gel capsules are the capsules that are kind of like squishy. Um, and sometimes you find them like in uh, like fish oils mm -hmm. or cold medication. A lot of cold mm. medication comes in that soft gel capsule. So what I'm going to make is the outer shell of that capsule. Ooh. And believe it or not, what I'm going to use is seaweed to do oh, it. Oh, okay. Yes. Nice. So what I have here in my hand is called alginate. And alginate, oh. alginate is just like this liquid that, well, it's actually a powder that I turned into a liquid. It's a powder that's extracted from seaweed. We literally like harvest seaweeds and then pull this this polymer out of the seaweed. Okay, and is then, that common what I, in um, like in the soft gels that you just find at the store that they're using something like from seaweed? Yes, yes, it is common. Nice. Believe it or not, so very safe. That's awesome. Yes, very I natural. It's a, yeah, it's a seaweed-based product. <laughs> and then what I have here is um, calcium chloride in water. So calcium chloride is just a salt. And the it's the type of salt that for any of our viewers who live up north, you know how sometimes you have to throw salt in the, on the sidewalk or on your steps on an icy day to melt the ice? Usually what you're using is calcium chloride. That's the type of salt that's used as a de-icer, okay? Gotcha. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add this alginate to the calcium chloride. And what's gonna happen is gonna be instant before your eyes, we're going to do a cross polymerization. And how Ooh. this works is the calcium likes to form two bonds. So they like to hold on to two friends. And basically what the calcium is gonna do it's going to find these alginate molecules and it's going to grab two at a time. And by grabbing two at a time, it forms like this cross polymerization and then it creates this really cool material that, like I said, is something that can be used to make a soft gel capsule. Okay, so here we go. Oh, I'm excited. Okay, I know. It looks like there's nothing here, but I promise you. <gasps> oh my gosh. Definitely is yes <gasps> and so we made like this polymer i like to call them warms because they're like nice <laughs> and long right but basically what's happened is on the outside of this we've done that cross polymerization and i know you can't feel it at home but i promise you it feels kind of like rubbery almost like plasticky yeah because it's like it's like this polymer and it's it this is the type of materials that can be used on the outside of like that soft gel capsule that we That's talked about awesome. in the segment. Yeah. What? So, That's so cool. Yes. We, we actually one time did on one of our streams molecular gastronomy and we were able to kind of get reactions like that, but I didn't it was with different like kinds of food products and we did use something that was seaweed based as well i don't ah, remember exactly what yes. it was but we were able to like make little like strings of things out of different food juices that would in the water or not in the water but in the solution turn into a similar shape yeah so cool very interesting that's it awesome is, it's very cool yeah so so, cool. so yeah so that's what cool i did sciences. with that class so cool and you know what i love about this experiment is like the applicability of it because yeah. like when students do it yeah it's super fun i mean come on it's like stretchy and fun to play with right but i mean these are materials that can be used in a lot of helpful ways right like mm -hmm. that soft gel material so science and chemistry is really cool what else can i say it's really cool it's really cool that's awesome and that is a visual way to see just how cool science is it's fun when you get to see it work right in front of your eyes too because you're not waiting yes. for anything and just like oh yeah yeah this is awesome yes it happened just like that i love it i love it that's so fun thank you for showing us that was awesome absolutely so, 
going back way back let's go into a little bit of your background so you're originally from brazil right correct i am and so I was then born you... in... nice okay yeah yeah i was born and raised in brazil we moved to the u.s when i was 10 um and i did not speak a single word of english when we moved here so, so i was like Super scary. Yeah. Super scary. And I have this story that I tell. Um, so when I moved here, um, I was like nine going into 10. So they put me into the third grade. Mm -hmm. And my mom took me to school the first day. She taught me how to say, hi, my name is Paula. So I had like that under my belt. And then I thought she was going to spend the day with me, like helping me get acclimated, uh -huh. maybe like translating for me because she spoke English. And uh, she dropped me off and she said, you're going to hate me right now, but someday you're going to thank me. I'll be back at three o'clock to pick you up. Good oh, luck. Oh, no. It was terrifying. But I'll tell you, she's absolutely right because it was the fastest way for me to learn because mm -hmm. I had to. Right. I didn't yeah. have someone translating and so forth. Right. And so um, this honestly is a lesson I've used in, the, in a lot of ways in my life. Right. Because even honestly, like some of the STEM subjects you may encounter like difficult. Sometimes you run into a hard physics class or a hard math class. Right. And you just learn that like you got to power through and you'll make it through and you'll make it to the other end. And that's what it was for me, you know, learning how to speak English. Right. I just had to power through work hard, do my best, and here we are, right? So it's, it's, it's an applicable lesson in a lot of different ways. Yeah, definitely. And that's, that's wild. But yeah, there's no better way to learn than to just have to fully immerse yourself in it. So did you notice that right away when you switched schools and started your new school, did you immediately latch on to more of the math side, math and science classes versus maybe like the language arts or things like that like that yes 100 percent, absolutely math is universal that's the best thing about math right Makes so sense. whatever language you're learning it in doesn't matter multiplications are always going to come out the same divisions are always come, coming out the same so yes i like math was definitely and and that could even lead to why like math was something that i just really excelled at and just kind of kept pursuing that's what right? i was curious about actually is yeah. like do you think that that move and having that thing that was like a constant that you were already that you already enjoyed already knew how to do did that help kind of lead you down that path that eventually led you into chemical engineering and pharmaceuticals yeah, I mean, I, I think there's some element of that in that for yeah. sure. But it also, it also, you know, with so many engineers in my house, I mean, I feel like math was always around us, right? That's and true. so it, math was always very natural in our household. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That makes sense. And so, okay, so then now jumping forward, you're working in pharmaceuticals, but you are working as a strategic marketing manager, right? Yeah, what happened there? So how did that happen? <laughs> so I worked as a chemical engineer for many years. I, like those manufacturing plants that I talked about, I worked mm -hmm. in those for several years, working with these huge reactors, climbing up ladders, and all this really That's cool awesome. stuff that you can do in a, chemi in a chemical engineering plant. Um, so... I, from there, I went in, back into the lab. I worked in, in research and development for a while, which is really fun. Um, so when the chemical engineer kind of goes back into R&D, now you're working more closely with that chemist, right? Because as I mm -hmm. talked about, like, that scale. So it's kind right. of like working with the chemist to help be able to scale up, right? So I okay. did that for quite a while. And after all those years working with all of these materials, these inactive ingredients, these excipients that I talked about in the segment, mm -hmm. I became kind of an expert in that, in that space. So I started visiting a lot of companies around the world that needed excipients and helping them. Oh. And so about eight years ago, one of our marketing directors reached out to me and said, hey, have you ever thought about a job in marketing? And I said, no, I don't even know what marketing is. <laughs> and he was like, 
actually, you'd be great at marketing because you understand our products, you understand the chemistry that's happening, you understand how our customers are using the excipients, you speak their technical language, you would be amazing to work in our marketing department. The marketing piece I'll teach you, but you need to teach us how our customers think about our products, how they use our products. And so, yeah, so for the past eight years, I've been in various marketing roles or different global product management, all kind of commercial type of roles. Um, but it's funny because I still use that technical side, right? I still have to understand Definitely. our products. I'm still, you know, but now it's with the lens of how do we help our customers? How do we sell these products? How do we talk about our new innovations? How do we launch a new product? So it's a different spin, but that chemical engineering background definitely helps as well. Yeah, and I'm sure that having that prior STEM education and STEM knowledge, you're able to just grasp onto it and you're still doing what you initially wanted to do and helping people, you're helping share these scientific discoveries or share what's happening and market it out in order to yes. let everyone else know what's happening. So then you're still yes. doing that in just another way that maybe you didn't expect to. Yeah. And to me, that is the magic of having like a strong STEM type of foundation. Um, I feel like engineers go into so many different careers yeah. I see engineers that eventually decide that they want to become lawyers or engineers yeah. that, you know, want to go into business like myself. So having that strong engineering foundation still allows you to go in a lot of different directions throughout your career. So I actually, it's one of my favorite things about the fact that I chose engineering. And even as I see other colleagues that are engineers, all the different paths that you can take because a career is a marathon. Let's face it. You're mm -hmm. going to be working for many, many years. So you can either do the same job year over year over year, or you can create a foundation that allows you to try different things and try different jobs and kind of change and pivot in different ways. And I think engineering really allows you to do that. Yeah. That's actually funny enough. That is something that Aisha Lari was also talking about. She was saying how you could go from being an engineer to a lawyer, but you, it's harder to go from being a lawyer to an engineer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And it sounds like that's kind of common. Is there like, I'm sure that there are so, so, so many different kinds, but are there, what are some of the different career paths that someone who studies chemical engineering could go down? So many. I mean, sure. <laughs> so as we talked about, yeah, I mean, you can do that traditional chemical engineering job that we talked about, which is taking that chemical process and scaling it up. You can work in more of like a quality function to make sure that the materials and the molecules that you're making are coming out correctly. You can work more in a regulatory function to make sure that you're meeting all of the regulations, the laws, uh, a lot of environmental laws that you need to make sure that you're meeting standards, right? You're not polluting as you're making these products. You can go into more of a supply chain role, which is kind of ensuring that all the products are there at the correct time. And then once you produce the product, how do you get it to our customers, right? So how do you mm -hmm. ensure that it's getting put into the right boats or the right airplanes? So it gets to India, China, right? Because Really, there are a lot of products that we produce that need to reach our audience globally, right? This just goes so, to show even more, like, all these different fields that I don't understand that, or, like, I just never think about that, okay, there's an engineer behind that. But of course there is. Yes. How else is it happening? Yes. How else you need an engineer <laughs> to fix all these problems? Yes. That's so fun. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. So... Also, it just goes to show you will never get bored if you have an engineering degree. That is the truth. Yes. Yeah. And you invent your career, right? So it allows you to, maybe you do a role for five years and you're like, oh, I want to try something different. And then you can do that. You can take that pivot and try something different. That's like so I did. True, yeah. I took a plunge doing marketing. I had never taken a business class, but I learned a lot 
along the way. That's the other thing I tell folks too, like you can learn something sitting in a classroom, taking a class about it. The other way to learn things is just by doing it as well. Exactly. Right. And that's, that's how I learned marketing. Yeah. Did you have, was there a bit of a learning curve when you were getting into marketing yes. and trying to learn this completely yes. different approach to what you were doing? Yes, there's definitely a learning curve, but this is what I always tell students as well. And I have to tell myself at times throughout my life, just because something feels hard, it doesn't mean you weren't meant to do it. Right. So when I first started marketing, I, it felt hard because it was mm -hmm. new and I had that steep learning curve. But then as I became more comfortable, I worked hard to understand the gaps that I had in, in knowledge. And once I overcame that, you know, now I've been doing it for eight years, right? Like, so I've become great at it. So I think the, the same goes for even when you go into a hard class, say you're taking this hard calculus class or something like that, right? Like if you have moments where it feels hard, it's actually moments where you're learning the most, if you think about it. Because if something Definitely. feels easy, then you probably already know it. But if it feels hard, then that's where you're really learning. Right. So you, sh you should seek moments in your life that are hard so you can learn. And I'm sure that's probably so similar to, for example, when you had to learn a completely new language in third grade and you were forced to do it. And that's the same as jumping into a brand new career field while you're already well into your career doing something totally different. Yeah. But it's like learning a new language and then you learn it, you have it down and then it's like second nature. And now you just do it every day for your job. That's right. And then you just move on to the next thing. Yeah. I love that. Okay. And so our final question before you go is what kind of advice would you give to someone who wants to pursue a career in chemical engineering? Um, I think I've thrown out some tidbits along the way, right? Yeah, to you've challenge some yourself. Very good ones. Yes, and, and um, you know, to not feel like quitting just because something feels hard. The other one, which I said earlier, but I'm going to emphasize again, is to build a community of supporters around you because there will be moments where you will feel challenged and you will need the help of your friends to make it through. And just in that same way, you need to be a friend to others as well and help them through their tough times. So whether you're in high school or going off to college, um, even when you start a job, like I have my own little community that I like to think of, right? Like when I have yeah. a problem or I have a question, people I can reach out to and ask, always building a community of supporters around you is really only going to help you to keep moving on up. That's huge. And that is great advice and something that, you know, to have that, that group of people that you could always rely on is so important. And I love what you threw in there about also being that friend and being that person for other yeah. people as well. It's, it's so important. And that's what will help bring you through it. You can, whether it's someone that's in the same field as you that can help work through those kinds of questions with you or whether yep. it's just someone who is there for emotional support, uh, it's all important. And so yes. for people like, let's say in high school or college, I'm sure a great way is to join clubs of their interest and then meeting people there. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Or even the classes that you're taking, right? If you're taking yeah. similar classes, there may be people within those classes that would be a good part of your, of your own personal community, if you will. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That's awesome. I love that advice. That is such great advice. Um, so, okay. So now where can people find you and follow along with you and your journey and all that? Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram. Um, my handle's at Watch Me Stem. I love that. Um, I'm that also is, you got a good handle, <laughs> right? I got a good one. That's a good one. Um, and I'm also on Twitter at Watch Me Stem. I don't I don't tweet as much as I, I definitely post more on Instagram than I than I do Twitter. Um, and then for maybe some of the older folks in the audience, maybe some of the high schoolers, if you're not on LinkedIn yet, I encourage you to go ahead and build your LinkedIn profile um, and start 
putting yourself into that space because that's what's going to help you find some work opportunities at some point. And you can find me there. I'm happy to connect with any of you. And you just look for me under my name, Paula Garcia Todd, and you'll find me there as well. Amazing. I love that. Everyone watching, you should definitely take Paula up on that opportunity and also follow her at Watch Me STEM on social media so that you can see everything happening and keep up with her and her cool STEM journey. Thank you so much, Paula, for coming on today. This was so much fun and I loved learning all about chemical engineering and your career path and your background and all of that. So much fun and so inspiring and you gave such great advice. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lexi. I'm so excited to be here. Yay. Have a great rest of your night and um, please come back whenever you would like. Thanks. I might pop by again then. <laughs> Yay. There we All go. Right. <laughs> Amazing. Thank All right. you so Take much. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Isn't she the best? She makes, she just, oh, it makes me want to go become a, an engineer because there's she, just look at everything that she was listing off that you could do as a as an as a chemical engineer but any kind of engineer um and all the everything that you are surrounded by was done from chemical engineers and so like she said make sure that you are appreciating your chemical engineers in your life and give them an extra hug for paula um thank you guys all so much for watching this was so much fun and thank you paula again for coming on we had a great time um, make sure that you follow us across all social media at CBS Unstoppable and make sure that you're subscribed here on Twitch and here on YouTube so that you don't miss out on any of our streams and so that you don't miss out on our fun new content on YouTube all about Miranda Cosgrove Stemloft. Um, and we will see you next week. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.